Hi, uh, my name's Rob, and I'm here to take you through the UCAS process. A little bit of information for parents and carers just to support you on the decisions that you might be making about whether to go into university or not and, and how we might go through it. Um, my contact details are on the last slide. So any questions that come from this today, please feel free just to drop me a line, drop me an email, and I'll gladly get back to you as soon as I possibly can. So to start with, I thought we'd just go through some basic terminology because I should imagine many of you have been to university, but no offense, it may have been a little while ago and some of you haven't been. And I just want to get a little bit of a parity of esteem, if I may, for you. So to start off with, the first one there is UCAS. Now, UCAS are the Universities and Colleges Admission Service, and everybody who applies to higher education in this country, particular full-time courses, have to go through UCAS. They're the ones that process all the information. And so in the UK, we have a thing called a common application scheme. So you fill in one form for all the choices that you're going to be making. Now we're predominantly looking at undergraduate degrees and these are terms that very often we use that we assume people know what they mean but an undergraduate is a degree that you do before you graduate but I've also included foundation degrees there and sometimes we might ask students to undertake a foundation it may well be in something like fine art where we look at the students portfolio and we just think they're they're a little bit undercooked if i'm honest with you they just need a little bit more time and that's not to to offend the applicant it's just that we want them to succeed and be happy on the course and make sure that they achieve all the outcomes that they want to out of there we have integrated masters now when we do an undergraduate degree we also have the potential to go on and do what we call a postgraduate after you after you graduate from your first degree integrated masters give you an opportunity to do these two things in one so rather than spending say five years doing this program you'll get to do it in four and we're seeing a lot of these in the fields of science technology engineering and maths we have sandwich degrees sandwich degrees once again are a four-year degree where the third year you spend in the world of work so we tend to see these in the fields of business studies where you might go out into industry and get some professional context and actually these are really good because it means that actually by taking those practical applications that you get in the in, in the work environment you're going to be more successful in your final year of your course because you've got examples and, and, and relevant that you can take forward into your exams and we also have Erasmus there now Erasmus is a European exchange scheme in all the things that are going on with Brexit this is something we don't really know much about whether it's going to continue but I do leave this in there because I want you to be aware that the opportunity to study higher education isn't necessarily just on the basis of the UK there's an opportunity to go abroad with Erasmus you can do that for a shorter periods of time or for a month or a term but also you know you can undertake a, an undergraduate degree in other countries in mainland Europe for example where they're actually taught in English so there's a lot of good opportunities there for you and on the other side of the screen I've got the different types of universities there are so we've got the Russell group and now these are the, uh, the bigger more research intensive universities out there Oxford and Cambridge they've been around for a couple of hundred years we have conservatoires now conservatoires are smaller a lot more specialists they're still universities they still teach degrees but they might do things on theatre set design or or there might be a music focus to them and so you know they're harder to get into because of the size of the institution but they don't offer as much as, as mainstream universities we have research intensive universities so a lot of these were colleges until around about 1964 when they took on university status and very often they'll have a large research park next to them I'll give you an example, University of East Anglia has a large science park and a growing, a burgeoning medical school there. And, and, and so there's an example there where the research really shapes the learning. And I think it's really important to understand that for all universities, the reason we exist is the research of the lecturers, of the academics, shapes the learning that the student's going to do on the course. So we've got to make sure we tie those two things together. And so we have post-92 universities or the newer universities, of which Leeds Beckett is one. Uh, and you'll find in most major cities, there'll be either a research intensive or a Russell group and a post 92, a newer university. And, you know, we're there. We focus on vocational skills. We have research intensive courses. We teach a variety of different things. And so we, we tend to find our portfolio of courses is much more diverse than you might expect. There are even newer universities out there. So the government changed the the uh, the quotas for being able to form universities and the population of students to be able to do that. We have private universities out there. And so there's some examples going around at the moment. And we're starting start to see a bit more of an increase in those. But also you can undertake your degree at FE College. And we're seeing more and more further education colleges are able to teach degree programs. They're accredited and awarded by a university, but you can continue to study those at the college where you're originally based. So 
when we're going to talk about UCAS, the UCAS there is a form, and if you're anything like me with all forms, there are deadlines. When do I have to get it in by? And so the dates we tend to work to is for music and some conservatoires, because of the audition process, you have to start a little bit earlier. So we tend to look for the deadline there is the, the 1st of October. And then for Oxford or Cambridge, or if you're looking to do medicine or veterinary medicine or, or dentistry, you have to apply a bit earlier because of the, the assessment processes that you go through. So they have a deadline of the 15th of October. But for everybody else, you tend to be looking at the 15th of January 50 okay but it has to be said we don't recommend you wait until that deadline you know we want you working on your UCAS form right the way up to it and very often we'll see with schools and colleges and uh, that they will have an internal deadline of around about the the October half term because staff in the school have to check everything they have to write references and make sure all the, all the process is in place so although this is an, an online process that you're going to go through with UCAS we need to make sure it fits into what the school actually requiring and then we're going to make decisions on what offers we're going to make students on the basis of the application form by May. And everything tends to come down to A-level results. Day. For those of you that are, have children that are studying BTECs, obviously their assessments will be completed before that stage. But all of these things fit together in a cycle to make sure that the students are successful when they go through the process. So the form is the form, you know, that we won't be surprised to know. We want to know your personal details. We uh, make sure your email address is correct. Um, you have an email address that you're checking all the time that things aren't going to fall into the spam folder. Uh, we want to know your choices. We want to know what qualifications you've already undertaken and those that you are taking at the moment. And, the, and your school or college will let us know about uh, any predicted grades that are in there as well. Uh, we have the personal statement, which I'll explain a little bit more about, and then the school reference. And that's a really important part of the process for us. So. To start off with on the choices, you have five choices to put on the form. And a lot of people only put down one or two, and I think that's a real wasted opportunity. I'd recommend you really take your time getting your research right and looking at what other options are actually available to you. So you have the five choices from potentially around about 50,000 different degrees. And there are new degree programs being opened up all the time. We're closing some, we're opening new ones up, depending on what the market dictates, depending on what research specialisms there actually are and what the need actually is. But you're looking at just under 400 universities you can study that so there's an awful lot of research that goes into this process sometimes we're purely looking for the grades or points to get onto the courses sometimes we might be looking for other skill sets so we have to be honest about what we're going to get you know are we aware realistically what we're going to achieve and if we're if we're clear on that then we should be able to take that forward okay but sometimes i find that people like to make their decisions on their universities on the basis of whether they take grades or points there are many many things to judge us on in universities i really don't think that's one of them so at leeds beckett we teach dietetics you explicitly need three b's at a level at the moment for that one okay whereas there's slightly more uh, movement around the ucas tariff points because we can collate your experiences from a variety of different areas of the various degrees that we're looking for we normally you know there should be an honors degree but what i've got there is other courses i've got ba which is bachelor of arts bachelor of science bachelor of music bachelor of engineering and then those integrated masters that i was telling you about they're the ones that begin with an m i can't stress enough that actually it's really worth looking into the differences to these kind of processes because it will tell you about the nature of the course so if you want to be a civil engineer I would strongly uh, recommend that you aspire to achieve uh, the, the grades to get onto a B eng. That gives you uh, more accreditations and the chance to become a chartered engineer in your own right. But accreditation is a really important thing. So I've just put BPS there, and that's the British Psychological Society. Please make sure that the degree programs that you're doing have the right accreditation. So yes, degrees on their own are worth a great deal to our economy, but certain professions require certain things, be it QTS, be it BPS, whatever it might be. So make sure that you're aware of exactly what industry you're looking for so that you can take that forward onto your further study. Uh, this gives you an example of the various grades or points. So when I went to, to university in 1864, you know, you got 10 points for an A. Uh, I didn't, but, you know, other people I knew did. Uh, but now we tend to find that because of the nature, the, the structure of, of A-levels and B-techs, they change the tariff requirements. And, you know, 56 for an A-star has got a lot more ring to it. Um, but this just gives you an idea. So sometimes if we're looking for 120 points at uh, for a particular degree course, we're essentially looking for three Bs, okay? And you'll be able to, but we know that students sometimes study a mixture of A-levels and B-techs and put them together. And that's how that works in terms of the new CAS process itself, okay? So how are we gonna make our choices? Well, yeah, I think location is a really important thing. There are certain parts of the country have certain industries. 
We know that some students don't want to move away from home. We know that some students do want to move away from home. We know certain parents want their kids to move away from home. Uh, location is a really important thing because it's actually about where you identify with, what you're happy about. I talk about the, the experiential learning side of things. So I went to, I grew up in a village in Kent and I went to a university in, in London. And it was that side of that learning journey that was the most important thing for me. And I think that's why cities like Leeds are so popular because we've got such a diverse community living with here, uh, living here. Uh, but also easy access to get to a variety of different places. But the, the size of the university matters. I'm, I'm very big. I'm very loud. I've got my microphone. Hopefully I'm not, I'm not blowing your eardrums away. Um, but I know that I couldn't fit into a smaller institution because of the nature of my personality. I needed something bigger. I needed a bigger space to work in. And hopefully that's something that you'll be aware of too. And certain courses have uh, you know, certain popularities. So we know for primary school teaching, it's still heavily dominated by females, still heavily dominated by females. So it's just something to be aware of in terms of, of competitive applications. League tables, you know, a lot of people use league tables and I understand why people want to use them. But we always get asked, you know, are you any good? Where are you in the league tables? League tables are only good. Stats are only good if you know what they mean. So there are two main different types of league tables, but there's more available out there if you want them. But if you're going to use them, be aware of what you're looking for. So is it spend per student? Is it entry requirements? You know, all these different things. So really make sure you, you break down the data that's available to you so you're making making the best of it. We also have TEF, which is uh, uh, available. Now, this is a thing that's come out quite recently, and you'll see the, the teaching excellence framework. You'll see various groupings of gold, silver, and bronze. And this is another form of assessment that the government do, just to make sure, you know, we talk about the student experience. Use those if you wish. Okay, there's some controversial opinions on the on all of these kind of things. If you're going to use the information, understand what it actually means. But also be aware of our research. And I think this is where universities are really exciting. And in the age of COVID, we're, we're hearing lots of the great things that universities are doing. Be excited about higher education. Find out what our research actually is. Where's our specialisms? What kind of differences are we making? We're not, we don't teach off a national curriculum. We design these things because there's, there's a, uh, a need for, for society to, to have this information. So we've got to make sure there's a relevance to it there as well. I'd also add that we've got the deferred entry and you can, if you decide you're not quite ready, there's a little tick box on the UCAS form that says, you know what, I, I just want to hold off for a year. Your offer still stands and we tend to find that universities accept these for about two years. And then, of course, you're going to be a very different person two years down the line. So we might ask you to apply then at that stage. But be aware of modern culture. You know, we, we have lots of people who are very cynical about education. We're in the age of the forensic psychologist. Still. I go around the country talking to students in schools. Everybody wanted to be a forensic psychologist. Do you know what a forensic psychologist actually does? And where do we get the information from? And very often we they're obsessed with death and murder and they've seen something on TV. That doesn't mean that you can study for a degree. It doesn't mean that actually there's a need to do it. You might be a brilliant psychologist, but does it have to be in the field of forensics? Can you use it in terms of, of clinical psychology, education psychology? Use your skill sets in a variety of different ways. And so when I hear people being you know, snooty about media studies, and, you know, we see this in the press a lot, I've got a 2 one in media studies. Where do we get all of our information from? You know, from the media, it's the journalists, it's the TV stations. There's never been a more important time to develop a full appreciation of what the media bring to the table and how we use that information. And sometimes we might just want to do a degree because we're comfortable with the subject. And that's fine. But for many, many people, they won't know what they want to do. So a, a tip I'd like to give you is to start with, if you go onto UCAS.com, there's the course search. Pick 10 subjects you've never heard of before and find out what they actually are. Because it could well be that there are subjects there that may change your life forever. You think, I didn't realize you could do that degree level. And give yourself the chance to be excited about higher education. Give yourself a, a chance to be excited about the very steps that you're going to go on and take rather than doing something maybe because it's safe or you just know what the word is. Do you know what anthropology actually is? Do you know what it means to go on and do these various studies? So I've got some examples of things here. We do uh, computer forensics and security. There is still a very clear need and, and look, we're working from home. How do we secure our information? How do, you know, if we look at fraud that's going on in the banks, how do we make sure that we're able to stop people's livelihoods uh, and lives being affected by criminality in this way? And so do, can, we, can we build defense systems? 
terrorists? Can we track the terrorists? Can we track all these people? And so we know we know with the major banks, you know, already we're still about half a million people short in this country. There's always room for growth in this. The second one is actually landscape architecture and design. And, and I mean, a lot of the people who want to be architects, but there's a real need for landscape architects in this country. There's a massive shortfall. So if you're interested in the world of design, if you're interested in horticulture, you're thinking you want to go forward, you know, and when we see that businesses are spending as much money on the outside spaces of their buildings, because we're all concerned about mental health and people's well-being. So landscape architecture is a fantastic field to go into at the moment. Data science, how we're using the algorithms behind all of our computer systems. You know, we know Facebook. It's a, it's an algorithm. How do we make sure we're using that correctly? If we're booking seats on flights and things like that, what what's the methodology? Where's the efficiencies? And so we need people to understand that. Something like sports development, you know, what we're seeing now is, of course, that a lot of community foundations are doing an awful lot of work. We need to understand how people engage with sports, the sociology of sports, what communities are, are working with, and actually how can we use sport to bring people together? And so there's so many great opportunities, events management, speech and language therapy, all these different things that you can do that you may not have considered at university because you haven't looked into what they are. Spend some time, use this opportunity, use this summer to find out what's actually available to you, and it could be there make a massive difference so the personal statement and there's another talk available uh, on our website where i talk specifically about personal statements i've got some very strong opinions on these things but you know we really want to know why do you want to do this course the grades that you get will tell us you're smart enough to start the course your personal statement should tell us why you're going to finish and that's a crucial thing for us that's what we need to know if we're going to give you this opportunity we don't want something else we want to make sure that actually you're taking advantage of everything that's actually available to you. And that may mean that you've got volunteering experience. And I understand that's very difficult in the current climate, but that might be one of those things you need to consider. Do you have any work experience? What kind of communication skills have you got from that? What kind of different people do you work with to draw these things together? If you want to be a nurse, you know, you've got to be able to communicate with people from different ethnicities, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different faiths, and you've got to have a calming, comforting uh, experience for those people. But also you've got to make sure that you're you're a good nurse you can convey information correctly and you're safe in the workplace but you know what we're also interested in your hobbies you know, what you do for fun you know, all these different things matter because it shapes your experience we want you to be happy we need to know that you you can separate work from play but also you've got the opportunity to experience things because very often if we ha if we have enjoyable hobbies and the great things that we go on and do we, we take those forward in our careers whether it means so or not it's just something we tend to find ourselves doing okay so if we go on to now how we respond now what happens is the form goes into the universities and it's processed by our admissions teams sometimes it might go to what we call an admissions tutor and that's the lead academic who will decide that these are the people I one on my course it might just happen within the admissions function that's there within the university and we'll come back with a couple of options we might say unconditional we might say you know what you've got enough experience you, you've been doing these things we tend to give these out to mature learners people who have already been in the world of work and they've got a thing called uh, uh, apel which is uh, an accreditation of a prior experiential learning i know it's catchy isn't it but it just means that we can take those things together and and and, and, and suit them and get them onto the actual course but we would normally come back with a conditional offer so those conditional offers may be based on grades or points we might ask to, to interview and we get a lot of interviews out there in the moment and of course if you're going to go for a music course or something to do with theatre and performance performance we're going to ask you to audition but those conditions can be a variety of different things you know we, we may well ask you on the, after your audition we might turn around and go well you know what you've done a brilliant job you've done a brilliant job there we're going to reduce our requirements to get you in there we may even make you an unconditional but that's all up in the air at the moment we may also turn around unfortunately and say you're unsuccessful um, and we're sorry about that. And, and I assure you that nobody goes into this process and oh, I can't wait to reject people today. It's not what we're about. So if it happens, we have to take it on the chin and think, so what, what else do I need to do? Well, you know, is this the right course for me? Is this the right way forward for me? If you are unsuccessful, there's a thing called extra that's available to people when they go on to uh, they, they apply to university. And it may mean that you get five rejections off your main courses. You can apply again on a one by one basis. I will be honest with you, if we take something like physiotherapy, where there's a lot of rejections that go on there because people don't convey their experiences well enough. If you're going to be rejected by five physiotherapy degrees, I'm not entirely sure you're going to be successful putting the same formula for six. OK, it may well be. And that, that's, not, that's not say you're never going to be a physiotherapist, not, not at all. It just means that the road that you go down may have to be slightly longer and you have to consider different things. But if you're really committed to doing those, you will do them. 
you know, we just need to make sure that we're going to put you on a course where you are going to succeed. There is no point offering you a place on a degree program that you're going to struggle with. So that's why that's in place. But it isn't just about us. The student also gets to turn around and say, you know what? I like you. I don't like you. You know, this there's a parity of esteem in this relationship. I want you to remember without students, we don't have jobs. You know, it's as simple as that. So the student gets to turn around and say, right, this is my firm choice. This is my first choice. And then this the insurance is their second choice. And that might be based on going to open days. It may be based on just the experience that you have with this. It might be on our, some online webinars that you've been doing. And whether you get a sense or a feeling for the university in itself. My recommendation is that if you set grade requirements for your firm and your insurance, don't pick ones that have the same because the problem is this on your on your firm choice. If you're unable to get the grades to get in there on results day, you will be automatically transferred to your insurance automatically transferred to your insurance and then you get a chance on, on UCAS to to withdraw from those kind of parts of the process either way you're firm in your insurance if you've done your research correctly you will feel happy and confident in your choices that you're going to make never treat the insurance as a oh, yeah I'll just put that one down really make sure that it's the kind of thing because there's a great opportunity there a fallback position isn't something that's always available to us so treat it as so treat it as, a, as an opportunity to really make sure you're happy and successful in what you're going to go on and do okay Okay, so lastly for me, this is what I call the mental peace factor, and, and this is the this is a bit design, designed specifically for parents and carers. I call it the mental peace factor because you don't get to sit in the exams, you don't get to do those kind of things, but actually you get the picture on your mental piece at the end of it with a piece of rolled up paper and a, and a mortar board on their head. Number one is the, the, the X factor versus the F factor, okay? What are they great at? Ask your loved one, what are they great at? Okay, this is a real skill that we now we're going into a competitive job market, a competitive life, and we have to be prepared to talk to people about what we're actually good at. Um, and, and you know, I've got a teenage daughter, and she's great at certain things. I might ask her what she's great at, and she draws into herself. That's not what we need. We need to be able to be prepared to. I'm not saying be arrogant, but I'm saying be aware of what you're great at and take time to celebrate those, and then be prepared to rule things out before you rule things in. You know, if if we approach this process. Uh, willing to consider all manner of options for us because it may well be the best decisions we can make is actually you know i don't want to do those kind of fields okay i just don't like science i'm not going to look at those but that doesn't mean we rule out all social sciences uh, and, and it might well be that there's a competence with maths but we don't necessarily like biology if we if we go into the process willing to look at everything and then say yeah no i don't want to do those things it gives us so many more options than if we go in and just say i just want to do this one thing do attend open days. There will be open days. There will be virtual open days. There'll be other open days that are available to you. Ask us questions. This is a real opportunity. But if if you do go to open days or you're part of a, an online open day, as parents and carers, I strongly recommend that you consider spending time with the support services because under data protection, when they come to us and they're 18, you know, well, we can't share any information with you. So, you know, the likelihood is you're going to be the person they call if they're struggling with something, if they're worried about something. So spend time with us. Find out how many, you know, grants and scholarships are available what's the accommodation like what's the recommendations there the things that give you the peace of mind so that you can support your loved one on their journey and let them you know because what we tend to find when it comes to the subject sessions is that's when the first seeds of friendship are planted and they'll get to know people on their course and then they'll go forward from there they'll be on facebook and other social media and they'll keep in contact and it's a great way of getting them settled into the course but you deserve the right to have that peace of mind as well equally do explore accommodation options from year two onwards. Certain students stay in halls of residence. Sometimes we get student living areas. Um, when I went to university many, many, many years ago, um, I didn't get my parents' help when I was choosing my house and, and the gas was illegal. Um, it was one of those where the, the kitchen and the living room was all in one space and, and the washing machine <laughs> fell through the rotten floorboards and dragged us all in with it. I'll be honest with you. I absolutely loved living in that house. Would I let one of my kids stay in a house like that? No way, Jose, no way. So please, whatever you do, you know, give yourself that confidence again. Have a little look around at certain living areas. And that might well be on an open day. Just have a little drive around town. You know, if you live if you live local to the area, have a little look around, spend some time doing that. But please do not go on holiday on results day. OK, we cannot make offers to parents. 
we cannot make offers to parents. So whatever we do, we need to be able to speak to the applicant. It may well be that we have to do a telephone interview. We might need them to pop in with some evidence for us or anything like that. So I appreciate, I mean, this this year has just been utterly bizarre. OK, and I understand that people want to go on holiday and, you know, are we going to be able to go on holiday? No one knows. But whatever we do, when it comes to that results day, let's make sure we're available on that day and a couple of days after that if we need to, just to make sure we can make the most of our opportunities. And so therefore drop out, uh, you know, drop manage drop out hotspots. You know, why do people drop out of university? One, they pick the wrong course. And if we've done our research, that shouldn't be it. Two is finance. And actually, by spending time talking to the university support services, we can get that finance information in place for ourselves. And three is, you know, very often it's it's homesickness or or boyfriend or girlfriend sickness. They, they, they will break up. Um, so, you know, um, it's about how do we manage those kind of things? What happens after Christmas and all those kind of things? So the best way to do that is we work on our life skills and our budgeting. You know, can they cook? Go grocery shopping together. Talk about the bills. And the bill when I was a student that really caught me out was the water bill. I just couldn't believe it. I was just like, oh, electricity, gas. I understand these. I live in the U I live in the UK. It does nothing but rain. Why on earth would you charge me this much money for for water? And that one really caught me out. So it's really worth as awkward as it might be spending some time on those actual moments there. The last one here for me is the Study Skills Handbook by Dr. Uh, Dr. Stella Cottrell, and it's a brilliant book. And I mention this book because. think it's important to empower yourself in the journey um, what revision techniques what's good work and actually be part of the journey so this book is fantastic for students it's fantastic for those doing their a-levels or the b-techs at the moment it's fantastic for those who are undertaking their degree but also it's fantastic for you so you can feel part of the process i meet so many people that go they go to school and they, then they learn to do this at school no, be part of it. Share with the share the experience with them and empower yourself. You may find out that you, you've developed a skill set in doing this that you might want to go on and retrain into different things. Think of yourself other opportunities. This book is a brilliant, it gives you brilliant examples. It's a brilliant textbook to use as a fallback position for all learners because everyone's study skills, strengths, and weaknesses are slightly different. Um, and, it, and it's a very reasonable price. And I, I, I'm not on commission. So uh, but hopefully you'll make use of that. And lastly, this is, as I promised you, this is my email address. Please do contact me. Uh, drop me a line. I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can. I wish you the best of luck for the future. Please do stay safe. Um, and if I can support you in any way in, in the future, be it through, through colleagues, through your school or, or independently, please don't hesitate to drop me a line, but do take care.